videos presented in this documentary were prepared by grantees in the 2009 DC Community Heritage Project Grants Program. The DC Community Heritage Project, a program of the Humanities Council of Washington, DC, and the DC Historic Preservation Office, supports people who want to tell stories of their neighborhoods and communities by providing information, training, and financial resources. So I said, I don't know, I guess, I guess the Holy Spirit got hold on me. Mm -hmm. And uh, told me, say, you going to better go on and join Second Baptist Church. Yes. And so Clyburn and I, yeah. and uh, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Dent, yes. he just grew up on Third Street. All of us joined the church together. We joined the church in February, February 59. 59. Yes. Yeah. And, and so, and, and I ain't never, I, ain't, I have never been in no, such cold water as I was. <laughs> I was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was glad to get out of that water. That water was cold. <laughs> the video, as mentioned, is, is called This Is My Story. And what we were trying to do was to uh, pull together the historical archives of the church. Uh, Second Baptist has a very rich history. The church was founded in 1848. And they constructed, or had that church constructed, on there on Third Street, that they were going to put a tower on the church, which would be the top of, of the church building. And uh, they ran into a financial problem. So if you look at the church today, there's no tower up there because uh, they couldn't afford it. Because we're just about the only Baptist church located downtown and in our original building, we just thought it would be very, very uh, it would be prudent uh, for us to start to build up a, a, an archive of historical documents that captures the story of the church, which is really uh, 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 captures the story of the African American community in downtown Washington. I have many fond memories of Second Baptist. <coughs> Perhaps uh, the dearest things to me have to do with Christmas. I can remember our wonderful Christmas celebrations and how our choir used to get in the bus and ride around to visit our shut-in uh, members and sing at the hospitals. But that was uh, something that made me look forward to Christmas for, I guess, for the rest of my life. So to be able to really get a feel for, a better feel for the, the history of the African-American community here and to hear the stories of members of the church who have been members of that church for generations and to uh, be able to share in what they remember. We would have Sunday school, then we'd have, uh, we'd, we'd be in church all day long, does I know that. And I was baptized when I was 13 years old, and now I am 95. Praise the Lord. And I will be 96 in November. Beautiful. I was born in 1913. Amen. Amen. We are very grateful to the Humanities Council for funding our project, and uh, we appreciate their support. And I am also grateful personally and also for the church for uh, Sister Angela Heath who worked diligently to uh, prepare the video and to uh, do the necessary editing and to just uh, to be an all-around stellar worker in terms of uh, helping us to produce this historical video. And just to be able to, to see how all of this fits together and to come up with this final production, which really is, I think, a very valuable art form because it enables people to quickly be able to see and grasp a story without having to spend hours reading it or to spend time talking with people and, 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 and extending the, um, the amount of time involved because when you talk to people, you have to process it and listen and then you have to stand back and, and sort of synthesize, but with this, we were able to put everything in uh, in a form that people could easily um, look at, relate to, and get the message. So I found it a wonderful way 
to be able to present the church history to people. Some, the nation's capital, is only a tourist attraction consisting of monuments, landmarks, and the seat of the federal government. But the city is so much more, a city with a rich history in which the African American community has been an integral part since the city was established. The documentary features African American architects who practiced in Washington, D.C from the late 19th century to the early, early 20th century. Hi, I am Michelle Jones, the producer for the documentary Master Builders in the Nation's Capital featuring African American architects. It is a documentary that will showcase um, architects who have long gone and some of them actually have been forgotten. It will be an introduction to uh, students who are interested in architecture to see the many projects in Washington, D.C. that these architects have designed. These architects have, um, have homes uh, designed by them during the 20th century and the 19th century that are still standing today. My co-producer, Will Stroman, has also been very instrumental in helping get this documentary off the ground. I'd like to thank the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities, as well as the Humanities Council of Washington, D.C., for help fund this very important project. I also would like to uh, thank Sign of the Times Workshop and Gallery for their uh, unconditional support in this project. In addition, I'd like to thank Dunbar Senior High School Engineering Department for allowing us to come to their school to talk to students about the importance of these architects who um, built buildings, built homes in their neighborhoods. They were pioneers in the field of architecture. They were architects who designed the homes we live in and which, by the way, the homes which make up the structure of our unique neighborhoods in the four quadrants of the city. Some of the featured uh, speakers in the documentary include um, Pat C. Fletcher, historian, uh, Richard Dozier, who is the Dean of Architecture at Tuskegee Institute, as well as Drek Wilson, whose book, uh, A Biographical Dictionary of African American Architects, 1865 to 1945, inspired me to um, produce this documentary. African-American developer John Whitelaw Lewis hired Isaiah Hatton to design his businesses. Industrial Bank on the corner of 12th and U Streets Northwest and the Whitelaw Hotel on 13th Street Northwest. These architects designed churches, office buildings, dormitories, elementary schools, university buildings, apartment buildings, and the like. I'm extremely happy to have in the documentary uh, Charles Cassell, Stanford Britt, um, Melvin Mitchell, all architects who are still practicing here in Washington, D.C. I'm extremely happy to have gotten permission from uh, the publishers to use the song Open Our Eyes by Earth, Wind and Fire, as well as the song Wake Up Everybody, because I do think that this will be a wake up to um, many who are just unfamiliar with 
um, the many contributions made by these architects in Washington, D.C. We chose the particular project, the particular theme, because we had a special situation where we had someone who had been in the District of Columbia for a long time and had contributed a lot to the community, uh, both Georgetown and the broader community, uh, specifically and most notably around the drafting of home rule legislation. I've served as chairman of the Democratic Central Committee since 1948 and through the year 1960, 12 years, longer than anybody else has ever served. My name is Idio Hukware. I was the creative director of the project Al Wheeler and Georgetown, memoirs, memoirs of a tireless builder of his community and city. Over the last half century, Al Wheeler has been a tireless advocate of positive change in his community and in the District of Columbia to an extent that has not been fully appreciated in the modern context. Well, when you get into historical documentaries, especially historical documentaries including and talking about legislation and business, some of the themes and some of the topics can tend to carry on and on and lose the excitement that you get in perhaps more of a cinematic production. But Al Wheeler's expression, the way he presents in a concise and yet very opinionated and strong way, um, how he viewed the history and his involvement makes this documentary a great uh, experience for the viewer um, and also made it a very a great experience, an easy experience uh, for us to produce. We could have created literature, uh, we could have uh, created perhaps some kind of monument or some other artistic expression of uh, Al Wheeler and his uh, contribution to Georgetown. But I came up with the idea, having known Al Wheeler for about two years through the Kiwanis Club of Georgetown, that getting this man on video would actually be very worthwhile. If you watch the documentary, you can see that Al Wheeler is a great natural orator. I applied to TWA, who had transatlantic and transpacific routes, and they agreed, accepted me, and I went, came to work with TWA. I was supposed to go to their home office in Kansas City, but they decided to move their home office to the Ring Building here in Washington, and this is how I came to Washington. We have a lot of people to thank for this project and the success of the project. We have to thank Al Wheeler himself, who's been a very influential person in Georgetown and in the District of Columbia as a whole. His son, uh, Jim Wheeler, for contributing his time in uh, putting together the photographs. Uh, I'd also like to thank the videographer, Andres Santiago, who uh, dedicated a lot of his time to the Kiwanis Club of Georgetown for their support, the Humanities Council that made this happen. The Monticello Hotel was originally built for the Dutch Inns of America, which was the first sweet hotel in Georgetown and one of the first in Washington. By highlighting the efforts of Al Wheeler, uh, the people involved in the project were also able to learn a lot about the whole history and the process. It was a fantastic experience. Uh, it increased my interest in media, the power of media to send a message. Having a first-person perspective from someone who was there and being able to catch them on video, to ha capture, recapture the passion, uh, relive through them as they comment on what they did uh, is just very powerful and again I think it makes a video uh, documentary format a very powerful way and uh, a very clear way to educate people on, on the topics that were covered. The community that we're talking about uh, starts at Morris Road to our north and ends at St. Elizabeth Wall to our south and then from Anacostia River to the west and going eastward towards Alabama Avenue. My name is Tindani Mpulabusi. Uh, I'm a director with Helping Inner City Kids Succeed. I name my project is Berry Farm, past and present. I'm an executive producer. Uh, we are awarded to uh, do a documentary preserving the history of Berry Farms, which has a very little known historical uh, background. In like the 20th century, Berry Farms got 
got broken down into like a smaller hood, like like like, like it is today. Yeah. It was a little bit left of Bray Farms, like the houses, the Palmas and Potchester. Which we live in. Which we live in. Like Berry Farm was actually much larger, uh, but its government encroachment, private business encroachment, has eaten up the edges of, of uh, Berry Farm for highways and, and businesses. I was looking through some papers in the resident council office, and I stumbled upon some information about General Otis Oliver Howard, who became the commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau. Berry Farm Community is one of the, the, it was the first free community, first place in D.C. where blacks could buy land. Uh, and it was the model community for 77 Freedmen's community around the nation. Bray Farms, it was a, a big, big, big hood. Like, it was yeah. big, like 375 acres. That's land. That's land right there. That's, a, that's the 375 acres that were, were pur was purchased by Howard, General Howard. And as I say, it was purchased by the Freedmen's Bureau. They bought these one acre lots, this is one acre, mm -hmm. roughly. Mm -hmm. And they were supposed to, the idea was that they would work in the city if they could. If not, they would raise um, plants and animals. Here was a real-time example of the industry and a demonstration of the aspirations of African-American people. Historic preservation is important. It's important for me to get youth. I did some banging, you know, hip-hop soundtracks to it. You know, I want to make it hip-hop friendly, youth friendly, get more young people involved in understand the importance of knowing their history, knowing their past, in order to provide for their present. And that was uh, why I did it, you know. That's why I did it, to tell a story. A particular track of land was hilly. And when I started reading the history, I didn't realize a dale meant it was a valley. But so it was hills and dales. And they decided, well, we're gonna change this name to Hillsdale. You just look at the terrain land that they had to tame because I mean this land was growed up with nothing but trees so these families had to come in and they they bought their acre uh, and they had to cut down all those trees they walked out of this community every day and walked up Nichols Avenue which was at that time probably called Asylum Road you know because it it was the road to St. E. Uh, to get the project done, um, I had to pull on some uh, help from some people in the community. Uh, started off um, with this idea of me doing this research in the Bray Farm Resident Council uh, with Ms. Pharrell's and Ms. Linda Miller's support for the Bray Farm Resident Council. And I threw a proposal to uh, DC Humanities Council uh, to help support the project. Ms. Patsy Fletcher with the Historic Preservation Office uh, helped me out, and Kaleem Umrani helped me. Uh, my lead scholar, Kalfani Ture, Trish Savage helped out. Uh, Councilmember Marion Burry came through, a lot of the community residents, and you know, of course, the Helping Inner City Kids Succeed youth uh, media arts team was a very instrumental part of making this thing happen. So, in Barry Farm in particular, a lot of us, the several buildings, the school buildings that were put up. Jeez, what's up, man? Excuse me. What's up? Speaking of college, y'all, uh, any of y'all know anything about Howard University? Are you talking about the time? How, yeah, Howard University. Some few girls up there, that's what I know. Do you know people that go to Howard University right now? No, not that I know. Don't you feel like since the people in this community kind of help fund that, that you should be able to get a scholarship? Yeah. You plan on going to college? Mm -hmm. But that also speaks to how closely uh, uh, brought together, knit together, Berry Farm and Howard University were. They share a common history. And the relationship between Berry Farm and Howard University, obviously founded by the same man that was the motive force behind Berry Farm. Um, it is strange, uh, it is troubling that Howard University today is not more closely involved in the Berry Farm community. There's a little known historical connection between Howard University and Berry Farm. I thought it was crazy how more people from that community were going to D.C. jail as opposed to Howard University. 
when a lot of the professors in Howard University had lived in Berry Farms and a lot of prolific people. You know, I reached out to Howard University students. They came in, in, in uh, you know, uh, big numbers down to Berry Farms Rep to rebuild this little known relationship. And we said, what well, is history? You know, history is his story. And if you're not telling your story, someone else is telling it. So I felt it was important to tell my story, you know, our story. You know, Berry Farm, past and present. For more information on the DCCHP grants and other remarkable projects accomplished by our neighbors, please visit our website, www.wdchumanities.org, or get in contact with me, Yoel McConnell, Director of Grants, at 202-387-8391.